Okay, well, um, thanks so much for joining the panel. I understand that Peter Ellison has a time restriction and may need to leave a little bit early in order to catch a plane. Um, but anyway, so, well, there's, we see plenty of technology around us today. Um, we didn't always have this technology around us today. Um, cameras didn't grow on trees. Uh, we didn't learn to fly by flapping our arms about. And we now have recording devices pointing at us to help us remember what went on. So what would you class as an intelligence augmentation technology? Starting with Tim. I mean, there are all kinds of, of examples. I'm not sure if, you, if you're looking for examples or for definitions. Um, um, mm -hmm. But uh, the, I mean, it, intelligence te augmentation technology goes a long, long way back. I mean, you know, the invention of the book, for example, was, mm. a, was a fantastic development in the augmentation of human intelligence. Um, you know, possibly the most important development ever. Um, uh, I don't know how you would rank those things, but um, so I, I think it's important also, I'll just add this in, that, that not every, th not every uh, technology um, is, is an augmenter <laughs> of, of intelligence, right? I mean, uh, we... The, the, uh, the many of the techno the most the fanciest technologies we currently use um, are um, at at best intelligence distractors, if not in intelligence depressors. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we have to keep <laughs> that in mind. Can you give me an example? Uh, you, you know, um, broadly speaking, uh, you know, television. <laughs> <laughs> that was brought up at a previous conference by Meredith. Uh, for Doig, example, actually. you know, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's um, okay. Peter Ellison, what are your views? Um, look, I suppose when you're talking about intelligent enhancement, I mean, you've had a good idea of what intelligence we've seen a, a definition today uh, that's quite workable. Um, you know, technology can 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 fall into several categories. You can it can act as a a store of knowledge, so you don't have to maintain that operating RAM, use it all up. You can just refer to it, be it notebook, book, or whatever else. Um, you've got the computational power where you can actually offload some of the stuff you're doing onto your devices. And then there's the communi communication aspects of it. And for me, I, the, in the way that I'm, I think can work is, is that I think the communication aspect of it is, is more exciting because I think it actually allows for the development of a kind of extended cognition between humans rather than between him and a machine. And that's kind of more exciting to me. So I kind of like, like to look for those ones mm -hmm. when I'm talking about augmenting intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, what would you think? Would you think education, institutionalised education, is a form of intelligence enhancement? Uh, not ours. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I think what you need to do is look at how that can work between individuals, how you can get that collective cognition going on, and then you build your institutions to maximise that. So I would say that's a future, a future project. Mm -hmm. Just to, just to butt in, I, yep. I noticed, Adam, that you used the word enhancement then, and I think it's very important to distinguish enhancement from yeah. augmentation. Sure. Uh, uh, you know, exercise is an intelligent enha enhancer. Mm -hmm. You know, people are smarter when they exercise more. Uh, but, uh, and there are many other types of intelligent enhancement. Generally speaking, I'm not quite as pessimistic as Peter. I mean, that, that education is, you know, by and large, could be a lot better. But... Um, but, it, but augmentation is some kind of external, uh, you know, resource or technology that, that we use to Im improve performance on the fly. I mean, and, uh, and yeah, so that's the distinction, I think. Mm -hmm. Nice. David? Um, yes, it was more specific. Okay. Uh, well, um, <laughs> have you got an example of a technology, for instance, such that you've used, um, that you believe may have... Uh, made you more effective or it, it enabled you to be more effective? Um, well, through much of one, much of history... Microphone. Sorry. Uh, so sort of def default state of consciousness, whereas now it's possible to take different pharmacological agents to modulate one's state of consciousness. Now, though one hears terms like uh, smart drugs, for instance, I'm quite sceptical. We have an all-purpose cognition enhancer, yet it's possible to take... For example, uh, a psychostimulant like uh, modafinil and so on, and one can modestly improve one's performance on a, uh, a range of cognitive tasks. Now, in the case of 
the psychostimulant, it may well just slightly increase signal to noise ratio for, uh, for other purposes. One might take uh, a, kind of a, a smart drug, let's say, that enhances cholinergic uh, function and a slightly different form of creativity uh, might be involved. Um, so, yes, a sort of interplay between the kind of pharmacological and also uh, the, the, the technological. Um, example of the technological, I personally, I aim to have my entire life on a single file of my computer. I aim to basically digitize all aspects of my life such that even if, uh, I don't know, uh, the UK were wiped out or something like that or complete uh, electronic uh, meltdown, it's, it's stored this mega file and I could reconstitute my life in uh, Australia without uh, uh, more than marginal inconvenience, uh, which wouldn't be possible uh, uh, 100 years ago. Interesting, but I'm not, not clear it would make you smarter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, well yeah. Uh, I think some uh, new topics, and that was a question I was going to bring up before, um, drugs and new topics. Um, do you think that these things are helping people, um, I guess, focus their attention uh, and does that equal smarter? What? How, how should we define this? I mean, like a Ritalin, for instance. Is that is that something that we should be taking? Is that really a, a good thing for children or, or people at school? Right? Is it actually helping them? I personally feel uh, it grossly overused. Is it, uh, American school children cons uh, consume ninety percent of the world's uh, Ritalin. Um, Ritalin or methamphetamine in many ways resembles a kind of long-acting cocaine even though it's technically uh, an amphetamine. It's functionally, it's very similar to a long-acting uh, cocaine. And uh, yes, although uh, it can modestly improve performance for some children uh, diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, it's a very limited range of particular cognitive tasks that uh, performance is being improved on. Uh, and the, uh, for instance, so uh, when one is talking about enhanced intelligence, um, is one talking, for example, of enhanced social cognition? Uh, uh, that's a very different set of, uh, of skills, very different mindset. If one wants to enhance social cognition, one should really perhaps be focused on uh, enriching uh, oxytocin function, uh, which is very different from, let's say, enhancing modestly performance on various mathematical tasks. Hmm. Peter Ellison, have you got oh, any no, comments no. on, uh, like... Uh, no, what he said. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what he said. All right, so um, well, what classes of uh, new topics would you recommend, then, uh, for the general pop populace, David, one, what, while we're on the topic? Uh -huh. Well, before Having going... coffee. I mean, we all know that. That's okay. <laughs> coffee, I would say, is, yes, the, kind of the staple of civilization. I would crawl through the gutter if that were the only way to get my fix of coffee. Um, yeah, before even considering the pharmacological routes, it's worth uh, maximizing uh, what nature has given us. So in that sense, uh, yeah, daily vigorous aerobic exercise, uh, a kind of idealized diet, which I would say is, is, is really critically important, good sleep discipline, cutting out various uh, unhealthy drugs, all this kind of stuff before even considering the pharmacological interventions. Um, another thing worth remembering, too, is such as the state dependence of memory, that if you're, let's say, cramming for an exam, that frequently, yeah, uh, uh, you take a particular drug. If you're not on that, in, that drug during the exam, the state dependence of memory means you won't particularly benefit uh, 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 from doing so. Um, yeah, you probably noticed a distinct note of uh, skepticism about uh, 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 smart drugs here. I don't mean to seem to be too uh, uh, too dismissive, but uh, yes, considerable caution should be used, shall we say. Um. Mm -hmm. Any comments, Tim or Peter? Well, I've taken exams on drugs and it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> what drugs were they? Hallucinogens? Uh, or? Very mild ones. <laughs> uh, okay. Fair enough. Okay. Um, well, what about, uh, you know, devices? We have a lot of devices now. I mean, like they're pretty much staple. I think most people have them in their pockets. Um, they're around us all the time, pretty much. Um, is, is anybody in the crowd um, utilizing apps or uh, applications on their smart devices in order to be more effective? Sure. Like, I mean, everybody uses email, right? Some of you might use a ca calendar. But 
What are some more exotic ones? And sorry, alarm clocks. So, is, is, have you guys had much experience in? Uh, have you attempted to use like a, a lot of the more exotic style of applications on smart devices? Well, yeah, I, yeah, I have. Yeah, <laughs> just because I'm compelled to do so. Um, look, what I, what I like about smart devices is is that they can help me be dumb sometimes. You know, I like to offload a lot of stuff that just occupies space in my head onto devices that can manage it for me. Now, I think that I think we'd all appreciate the fact that if we're trying to carry a lot of stuff in our head, if we're cluttered, we can't be as creative and relaxed and productive as we can be otherwise. For, for me, one of the great advantages of, of, of technology, and particularly smart devices, is that I can offload a lot of that. And, and it takes care of it for me. My, my, it beeps when, it tell, when I need to do something. It stores information I don't need to store. And I can be free to be more relaxed and more creative. And for me, this is a, this is a huge, I mean, this is an augmentation and an enhancement at the same time because it allows me to, to operate in a way. And ironically, I think this is, this is actually, I try and make the technology help me at least in that it, 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 frees me from having to deal with the issues of daily life rather than becoming an issue of daily life. And I think that's a nice goal that we could be looking for. Um, so I think in that type of that sense that, that cognition is important uh, to, to maximise by offloading stuff onto apps. So I look for apps that do that for me. This is a kind of filter for me. Mm -hmm. Does that. Have you, is there a Your View app here? <laughs> yeah, hopefully there will be uh, one day. Um, in, in fact, uh, if your view works really well, uh, then um, it ought to be uh, a shortcut intelligence enhancer in the sense that um, any, in a hypothetical scenario where it's functioning very well, any rational person, uh, when asked their opinion on a, an important topic like carbon tax or whatever, should say, I don't know, what does your view think? Because you know it ought to be just like uh, you know if, if you're in 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 the market in if, you know in the stock market, um, the the rational person ought to you know by default say uh, the value of the stock. How do I know? It's what it, what did the market tell me? No, that's that's the uh, the irrational person thinks that they're better than the market, uh, but the they they can make a wiser opinion. But uh, look, uh, in terms of pro, uh, intelligence in, in, or, or uh, cognitive uh, enhancing apps. Uh, I, I, most of my cognitive work, of course, is not done on a smartphone. It's done on a, on a big, you know, multi-screen computer uh, type of setup. Um, I, there was a, there was research. Um, uh, uh, I think it was about ten years ago now by Microsoft uh, research, which found that uh, the by far the greatest way to biggest best way to enhance productivity of office workers was to give them two screens or to give them bigger screens. Mm. Uh, and um, so make sure you've got you know. All this working with tiny little screens is is, is a limitation, uh, but uh, most of my work is done, um, you know, with, with a big multi-screen computer, you know, with constant connection to the internet, and and there's no doubt that that constant connection is is um, you know enriching, enhancing in in all kinds of sorts of ways. I couldn't function really, you know, these days without it. We given the kind of work work that we do now, but at the other on the other hand, if if I really want to think about something. Then my f my greatest friend is a little a little app called Freedom. Anybody use Freedom? Uh, yeah, Andrew done. Freedom is is a uh, uh, for a, you know you, you you install it and it gives you tell it uh, you know I want Freedom for for an hour and it switches off all internet. And you can't get internet back without uh, restart rebooting your computer because you don't want to do that. So in other words, um, if you really want to enhance your thinking, it's important in in some ways to to be free. Of all the you know the the, the wonders of, uh, of the uh, interconnected uh, you know technologies. Yeah, that that was uh, another question. What are some of the fundamental limit or not fundamental? What are the some of the limitations of um, some of the existing technologies which is which are slowing you down, and how do you find your way around them? You've already answered that one, Tim. Um, Peter. Um. I think it's actually quite interesting. I think there has been a kind of transformation. It, it sort of come out in the last maybe 12 months or so where I always used to find that the use of a, of a, of a phone in particular 
was slow enough so that my, my brain would race ahead and then I'd, I'd have to stop for it to do something and then it would interrupt my train of thought. I couldn't think and use in the, quite the same way. And it's only been really recently that these things have become fast and responsive enough so that I can be doing this as I'm thinking of something and it's not, I don't have to break my, my, my train of thought to go back and wait for this to load or two seconds or three seconds here. For me that speed of operation is incredibly important because I think it, it, it means it's following my thoughts rather than my thoughts being staggered and stop start to follow the technology. That's a really important thing for me. That speed I would say is, is one of the, the, the things. So in terms of limitations, it's slow stuff. Mm. It doesn't match my thinking, and so not that I'm particularly fast, but just it's not as fast as most people would, you know, normally flip from thought to thought or idea to idea. And it's nice to have the technology just following you along, rather than you coming back and waiting. So at the moment, some of the interfaces are are, are very cumbersome, and it's very hard to sort of uh, use them because they're slowing you down, they're slowing your the tasks down. And therefore, a lot of people probably wouldn't adopt these technologies as widely as they would if the interfaces were a lot better. I think, yeah, I think Werner Vinci said that interfaces have a lot to do with making the human species a lot more, uh, a lot more intelligent um, or augmenting uh, human intelligence. Have you got any comments, David? Yeah, I'm very much looking forward to hacked versions of, of, of Google Glass because uh, it said we are designed, as of Dunbar's number, to live in tribal groupings where everyone knows uh, 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 everyone else, uh, whereas today, of course, we li li live in anonymous cities. And though a lot of people are worried about the privacy implications, I would be absolutely delighted if, let's say, a social event, you sort of meet someone and I can instantly uh, see, let's say, that uh, the, the papers they've written or their, 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 their family and so on, and one can have some kind of personal relationship uh, uh, with someone uh, with this augmentation technology. Now, clearly, there are privacy implications, but there are privacy implications living uh, in a village or a small uh, tribal society. It's, uh, it, it's a matter of trade-offs. But um, yeah, whereas today, standardly, one can maintain relationships with perhaps uh, 150 odd people uh, with some degree of intimacy in future, it would be possible to do so with a, with a much larger range uh, of people. And yeah, there are cognition, uh, cognitive enhancing benefits there for the quality of our relationships with, 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 with so many people, potentially. Yeah. What sort of t what class of technologies are, are you all looking forward to? I mean, we know about Google Glass. Um, you may, may have heard of uh, life logging and things like that. What what sort of class of, of technologies are you looking forward to in order to uh, make yourself more productive or whatnot? Sorry, yeah, you can start if you like, David. That. You've got something. <laughs> Well, this is, uh, this is back to the, uh, the hedonic treadmill again, and that though one has the illusion that all, you know, the, these gadgets, these ideas, uh, yes, I imagine Gadget X or, or Y or improved screen resolution, uh, all these sorts of things will enhance the quality of my life. I'm not convinced at the end of the day that my quality of life will be radically improved by many of these shiny new gadgets. Mm. So is the future... Uh, Full of shiny gadgets with blinking lights. Is that is that is that the way most people look at the future? You think out there in the world, they see it as the next version of iPad or whatnot. I think, yeah. Okay, that's a rather simplistic way of putting it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as you know, I'm actually quite pessimistic in terms of uh, yeah. Uh, even if if you may wave a magic wand and grant people all their wishes, and this you also enhance their reward circuitry six months' time, they're not actually going to be happier, probably. Hmm. Well, I think that um, I think the iPad was a step in the right direction. I love the, the, the advertising theme for the iPad because it, it, it said you already know how to use it. Now, for me, that was a great step in the right direction after years of PC. <laughs> um, but I, I think, you know, I, 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 people think I like technology. I actually don't. I hate technology. I love what you can do with technology. I love the things that it can do for you. Um, and you know, I want it. I want it slaved to me. I don't want it. I don't want the way I do things to have to change to accommodate the technology. Um, you know, it's like when you when you work in a in a in a curriculum environment and you have the IT guys telling you how you have to organise your curriculum. It's just crazy stuff. You know, it should be slaved to what we need to do. 
And and so um, I think the iPad was a step in that direction. I don't know how we faltered. I don't know how it will go on. But it was it was something better um, than it was. So I, I, what I look forward to are things that sim that are more seamless, more more integratable into what I do, and more more responsive to what I naturally need to do. And I don't want to have to change my, my my most productive ways of doing things to match a technology solution. I don't like solutions that tell me what my problem is, if you know what I mean. Well, a lot of transhumanists, for instance, look forward to technologies becoming more intimate with um, the person. Uh, John Smart, who came down to Australia a few years ago, I had a discussion with him, and we spoke about digital twins. Um, and he had the idea that these things are getting smarter. These are personal devices are going to get really smart in the future um, in such a way that these things will be able to mine information that we just don't have the headspace to really uh, spend a lot of clock cycles uh, worrying about, okay? So, for instance, if we're at a supermarket and we want to buy a product, for instance, we want to buy a pair of shoes um, and we want to know that the shoes were uh, produced under ethical uh, standards, then the, the AI or the, the digital twin or digital, digital symbionts would sort of learn our sort of preferences in a sense and, and would be able to guide us to the pair of shoes which would most fit our, our uh, ethical uh, framework. So, yeah, I mean, like, if, if, that, if these sorts of technologies came about, do you th do you th what sort of impacts do you think this may have? as a scenario for the future. I'm not saying it will happen, but just treat it as a scenario for the future. You're asking us, in a sense, to be futurists. Here. Yeah, uh, come on, be a futurist with us. It's not a role I've ever <laughs> really fancied myself in. Uh, but, um, well, yours is only 10 years long, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, well, look, I, uh, I had an interesting thought. Oh, yeah, so... So imagine that you know these technologies can do all these things for us. Um, some of them are, are, are things that we sort of are consciously engaging with and, uh, and, and perhaps helping us think about certain sorts of things. Others are just sort of invi invisibly operating behind the scenes. You know, various forms of intelligence that uh, take away a lot of the kind of mundane things that we have to do. Uh, you know, so imagine I could just you know tap my fridge and say, well, you know, I'd like to you know uh, cook a curry tonight, and 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 my fridge instantly figures out what it's got, what it needs, it arranges for all that to be delivered and, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, even knows what kind of curry I'd like and, and where the best fresh fish is and so forth. Um, you know, that, in a way that's sort of nice, but, but where's the end point of all that, right? Um, the end point of all that is, is that you, you're freed up to do what? Now, for most people, it means freeing them up to do ever more moronic sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so I don't see any great utopia in, you know... In, Having in more that, time. Right. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll just watch more AFL, you know. You know. <laughs> you know stuff like that. So, so I, I, I don't... You know, this is, of course, bracketing all the worries about social collapse. Mm. I think you're right. If you look at the cartoon shows, you look at the future where people are just doing stupid things. Mm. Um, you know, we've that there's there is. I'll say again, there is this, this again, this this implication that with the ability to be certain ways and the freedom from certain things, that this golden path will appear before us that we know to follow. I don't think that follows at all. You know, I mean, I think there's a fair bit to be gained from thinking to yourself this afternoon. I'm just going to plan dinner, think about what I need, maybe go for a shop and walk down the shop and do that. I mean, this is not something we want to lose necessarily. I mean, we don't want to be slaves to it, but we don't want to lose it either. So, yeah, no, I agree with that. I think there's, you have to have an alternative if you're going to free up your time. Yes, I mean, perhaps ultimately intelligence is overrated and in that when we have reached, for instance, uh, uh, let's say, the state space of ideal states of consciousness beyond which it is not possible to get any, any better, whether they are aesthetic or forms of consciousness that we can't even yet access or describe, uh, what is the point of leaving this uh, this this state space of of, of, of wonderful uh, ideal states of consciousness? It's only because we live in a rather kind of uh, harsh world full of problems that uh, yeah, in a sense, one needs to be 
uh, uh, I- I- intelligent. Okay, well, um, Peter Singer speaks about the ex- expanding circle of ethical consideration. Um, and so technologies may, al- may make us smarter, may augment our intelligence. Um, do they make us more ethical or can they make us more ethical? By sheer fact that we, ha- we, we can concentrate on larger landscapes of eth- ethical cons- of a possibility or ethical consideration. That's a question. Go for it, David. Uh, well, yes, as I said, uh, I regard uh, our ignorance of other uh, non human animals and traditionally, in many cases, the perspectives of members of uh, other tribes as a profound form of ignorance. It's not merely a, a lack of empathy with empathy treated as a personality variable, it's a lack of understanding of the, uh, the nature of the world. Uh, and it would in, th- would in theory be possible to use technology to, uh, uh, to do perhaps the equivalent of a, vi- of, of a Vulcan mind meld with, yes, members of, of our own species, but also uh, other species too. Um, here we touch again on uh, what I was talking about earlier, the, the binding problem. What are the necessary and sufficient conditions to have a unitary subject of experience? Um, now, in the case of uh, um, uh, uh, conjoined uh, twins, there is at least one case of, uh, of, of two twins that are uh, 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 twins such that there seems at least part of the time to be a, a single uh, subject of experience. Now, it might, impossible, might in future be possible to do uh, kind of reversible mind melding with something like thalmic bridges or something like that. Uh, and I think it would radically change the nature of everything from, well, for example, decision theoretic rationality. At the moment, it's regarded as, as, as kind of axiomatic, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, sort of game theory and so on that uh, one only takes into account one's own uh, uh, desires and preferences, but in a world in which one can reversibly mind meld with other subjects of experience, uh, um, it, it's almost just behaving selfishly as, as, as akin to two mirror touch synesthetes having a f- fist fight. I mean, it's just not going to happen because, uh, yeah, if you punch, uh, <laughs> uh, you, you, it's as though you experience the bad stuff yourself. Um, so, yes, it could even change the nature of, of, of what it is to be rational. Um. Hmm. Peter, have you got any comments on? Oh, uh, I guess. I guess what? I mean, we know more about suffering in the world now than we ever did, and we don't care anymore. Um, I don't care anymore than we. We don't care anymore than we used to. You know, that doesn't seem to have made a d- distinction. The simple knowledge know? of the facts. Well, I, I can't see any great shift in our society that has, has you know, means things are changing to that end. I mean, I think. I think some people do. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But uh, you know, but it, part of the reason for that, I think, comes with the freedom to be able to do that too. And um, but you know, it, it's so easy to to access images, and, and and this is this is the problem with the iPad. I think that when your image of um, a war-torn village comes to you in the same frame and the same platinum as your video games this has to have an effect on how you see it I think you know this is the same vet, same thing that's delivering the same information what how are you distinguishing between it I mean, for me this is a really important idea uh, and I think that if if our information about the world comes to us all in exactly the same way then that has implications for us I mean there was a time when if you if you if you want to know what what life was like in a in a in a in a, uh, a poverty-stricken village in a third-world country, you would go there, and you would land, and you would experience perhaps heat and flies and odors, and you would travel, and you would meet people, and you would see suffering, you would touch it, you would acknowledge it, you would be part of it, and then you would go. But now you can get it in exactly the same mechanism by which you you play video games, and I think this is this has been a uh, this is a profound shift in how we, we see the world too. We have to now abstract 
the idea of suffering in a way we we never really had to abstract suffering before because it was always there f for us in some sense. So this to me is a is a is a processing issue of of these of these issues, and I think technology is there's a problem there. Um, it helps in other ways, but there's a problem there. That's an interesting point. Um, so, well, Stephen Pinker in a recent book, uh, Better Angels of Our Nature, would argue that violence um, is going down. Um, yeah, does that mean that we're more moral? I, I don't know. Did, um, what do you, have you, have any of you actually read that book? Yes, yes. unfortunately, I, I, it was designed to be edifying, but uh, the horrific descriptions of the nature of suffering and cruelty in the early eras uh, actually depressed my spirits. Uh, it depends on one's conception of the nature of, uh, of, of, of time. Uh, I just think of these horrible things as happening elsewhere in space-time. Um, in one sense, yes, I think, uh, 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 yes, Stephen Pinker is correct. Everyday violence has declined. Uh, from medieval times. In another sense, uh, uh, yes, kind of institutionalized violence against members of other species and also, of course, the possibility of, uh, of, of, of a nuclear holocaust. It's very easy to, I mean, when one's thinking as transhumanists as the more exotic risks, uh, uh, post-human superintelligence as a result of AGI going foom or something like that, but uh, I think probably more likely is that uh, 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 China, let's say, goes to a war with Japan over the, these uninhabited islands, and then America is sucked in because of its defense. These, once again, uh, let's hope it isn't that particular scenario, but uh, 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 yes, there is the risk of complacency uh, uh, with this perspective. Yeah, so um, with technology, advanced technology comes advanced power, there could be a very sharp spike, even though on average, uh, it, you know, things may be getting better. Um, Tim, do, do you have, have anything to add to that? Yeah, um, look, I'm, I'm broadly sceptical, like Peter, I think, of, I don't see any evidence that, you know, all, all these wonderful technologies and, and intelligence augmentation and so forth uh, is, is expanding our ethical uh, circle of ethical concern. I, uh, uh, with regard to sort of Pinker's thesis, I think we've got to put things in some kind of proportion. Um, you know, the sort of the nasty face-to-face -face violence um, that characterised tribal societies and so forth um, may be, uh, relatively speaking, on the decline. But on current projections uh, for, you know, climate change over the next century, um, there will be suffering and death on a scale utterly you know, with no historical comparison, right? In terms of the number of people who are going to suffer, who are going to die, um, it, it's, it utterly dwarfs anything in human history. Uh, but we don't, you know, it, the numbers are too big, you know, for us to comprehend that, you know, but, um, but that's effectively what's going to happen. And uh, as far as I can tell, all our technologies at the moment are, are pretty much uh, helping us avoid dealing with that, you know. Pretty yeah. sweeping statement. Did you say all our technologies? Well, uh, look, obviously that is a a, um, uh, a sweeping statement. What I meant what, what I meant is the net effect. Uh, uh, you know, it's it, with all these in all these discussions. There's always these, these pros and cons, right? The apps on my you know iPad. You know, some of them are uh, cognitively um, enhancing uh, in some ways, and some of them are. Um, are Cognitively destruct destructive. Uh, there's also, you know, interesting data coming about uh, out now about um, uh, students' capacity to concentrate for more than a few seconds on anything, right? which is being eroded by the, you know the video games and the Twitter and so forth that they're constantly ad addicted to. A little out of mine. So, uh, uh, and you know, so so the, so you've got to look at net effects, right? and uh, and. The, if, if you think about what I call the, the, you know, the forces, of the, te the technologies of mass distraction, uh, uh, which are part and parcel of all this good stuff that, you know, that, that we talk about, uh, are so powerful and so pervasive um, that they make it possible for us to, um, to effectively avoid thinking about the greatest cycle of violence which humanity has ever and will ever witness. So. Yeah, I, in many ways I'm share this pessimistic diagnosis, but on a more optimistic note, uh, high technology does uh, enable, our, let's say, our, our weak benevolence to, to go a great deal further. I mean, just take the example of in vitro uh, meat and that when in 10, 15 years' time there will be the option to choose in a supermarket between 
uh, flesh from uh, uh, slaughtered animals and uh, uh, in vitro meat, uh, I suspect most people will uh, choose the cruelty-free option, that only a minority of people today, for instance, will be morally engaged by the issue of, of animal cruelty and suffering and exploitation. But most people, I think, are, however weakly, uh, but they, uh, benevolent and uh, yes, this, 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 this force multiplying effect of technology that even a very, very slight degree of weak benevolence goes much, much further today, potentially at any rate. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Um, well, Julian Savalescu, who you may know, um, he's an Australian, uh, but he, he spends half his time at Oxford there for the center, uh, the Hero Center for Practical Ethics. Um, now, he, he's sort of uh, written very provocatively in a book called Unfit for the Future, that our basic um, human nature uh, may, may not be good enough to, uh, to uh, keep us from destroying ourselves in all likelihood. What, would, you, would, you, would you do agree? And if you disagree or agree, what, what are your comments? I, I think that, I mean, I, I, like, like Tim, I think, or I think like both gentlemen, I think that, you know, we have the potential of vast catastrophe. We, we really do, because the numbers of, number of people and the, the pace of what's happening and the, and the, the, the destructive potential is, is becoming so vast so quickly. I think that our, our, our greatest danger is that we don't recognise who and what we are and we pretend that we're something else. Now, this is not to say that we're not looking towards a transhuman future. That's all well and good. But I'm saying until that point happens, I don't think the technology, like, like Tim, I don't think the technology is going to get there in time for us. I think, I think the, first, the first collective human project needs to be to acknowledge and understand what we are and how we operate. And um, through education. After that, well, yeah, but after that, we can um, we, we can we can then maximise our potential in various ways. But unless we know what we what we are and how we actually work, and we acknowledge that and we embrace that, in fact, then I think um, we're we're really going to have a problem. While our institutional, uh, while our political systems are, uh, and our, our our power structures and our economic structures are geared as they are, um, you know, this is just them in control of us. Um, and you know, I, I really don't think we have a chance to get to some of these utopian or dystopian futures until we first come to grips with, with ourselves. Yeah, so how, how can we do that? And um, well, let's acknowledge that there are some technologies out there. I mean, that we, we have critical thinking tools, for instance. Um, we have plenty of literature uh, about um, evolutionary psychology. John Tooby, for example, has um, written a lot on that. And uh, we have um, websites like Less Wrong, for instance, that has a, a, whole, a plethora of uh, interesting information to tell us how we're biased and how to overcome that. So what can we really do? What can we do now to, um, I guess, become better without you know, technological uh, implantations or big radical transhuman futures? Yeah, I'll look at the time. I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, there's no easy answer to that, and I don't pretend to sit here a bit glibly say it. Um, and, uh, but I, I am pretty sure that whilst there's going to be a, a, a lot of things that we can do to help us with our communication technologies to do this, and I, Tim's work is great in this regard, um, that we have to do far more in terms of shifting our paradigms about um, basic education, basic social structures, that that uh, and and ways of, of thinking um, collectively and collaboratively um, and, and in, in, in some sense in the same flavour that Tim's working with and in some sense in other flavours um, that, that it's, it's just this idea of the, the, the extended social cognition that you were, you were referencing before that you know, we can think as an organism um, but not, not in the sense that we are a supermind because we have a whole bunch of individuals thinking and that collectively there's an emergent property, but rather the individuals are thinking together actively, not just individually and having something else emerge, but 
actively working together. I think there are ways to do that, which you know takes too long to say now, but I think that's I part would say of that it. actively working together is part of the definition of a supermind in the sense that I... Yeah, yeah I think so. This, this, this extended cognition between two people and just groups can, can happen um, in a very enmeshed way or a slightly enmeshed way, as long as it's happening. And I think that's right. I mean, Julian Sivadescu talks about uh, moral enhancement and how it's, it's this kind of designer babies. And other things being equal, one might imagine that it is highly desirable that we become more empathetic, we develop our mind reading skills. Uh, however, uh, it's also the case that in some contexts, at least, one wants to encourage this capacity for detached, impartial rule following. It's not necessarily the case that people have a very low AQ, low Asperger's score, uh, behave uh, more ethically, more morally than people who are sort of way into Asperger's territory, in that uh, a woman, for instance, who gives her 10 million pound fortune to her cat is highly empathetic, but she's not an effective altruist, whereas someone with a very high AQ score like Bill Gates or some other, even dare one say it, transhumanist one, those can potentially be far more altruistic in the actual consequences of their, ac of their actions because they're more rational and systematic and rule-following and Asperger-ish, if you like. So what is really desirable, I would say, therefore, is the capacity, ideally, to be able to switch cognitive styles as appropriate. Uh, and uh, yes, so in terms of moral enhancement, it's actually quite complicated. I don't think we've reached the stage where one can uh, uh, fine-tune particular genes for being, in a straightforward sense, more moral, because it, uh, it, it, so, so often it's a case of the conditionally activated behavior, and that someone who is a hero in, in one context could be a war criminal in another. Well, it's been a uh, rather agreeable panel. I mean, you all seem to agree with each other quite right. Is, it, is there anything you can disagree about? <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yes, God. God would be a good one. <laughs> hey, well, well, I mean, like, is I, God, I think, a, is, is God a, a technology for moral enhancement? God knows. God knows. <laughs> No, I think the well, point of disagreement. Sorry, I, go on. I, I've tried to be pretty out there and provocative, and it hasn't worked. But um, <laughs> uh, but, but let me voice. I, I said, you know, I'm an ex, ex philosopher, and I used to think quite a bit about um, issues that uh, David and and uh, uh, Marcus, you know, work on. Mm -hmm. um, I think that these are, I mean, I can see the philosophical sort of interest in them, but um, but I, just to be provocative, I would say, look, really, don't we have more serious problems that we need to work on sooner uh, than that? I, you know, it's, I, I find it hard to get excited, to get to get anything like as interested as, as I did, you know, 20 years ago mm. in, in questions of, you know, like, uh, you know, super in intelligences and, and, you know, singularities and so forth. Yeah, maybe, maybe, but... But it seems to me that there are um, much more tangible, much more immediate problems, challenges that require all the wits that we've got uh, uh, to, um, uh, rather than speculating about such things. So, you know, I'm obviously trying to be rude here, um, but... Uh, yeah, that's fine. I mean, like, um, but what makes these problems more tangible, uh, or more tangible than, like, an existential threat, like an AI fooming or... Um, your nanotech uh, becoming like a real powerful technology could be weaponized. You know, look, fifty years time, who knows? Maybe, um, but uh, but right now, um, you know, see a lot of these things depend upon. Um, uh, you need to set up the problem. You need you need philosophical assumptions, right? Uh, and you need commitment to certain, you know, theses. And you know, like David's stuff, a lot of it hinges very heavily on this, on this uh, uh, binding problem, right? And to which I say, in fact, I, if I was, had have asked a question in question time, I would have said this, and I'll ask it now, um, David. Uh, I, I know you think that you think this is a really deep and important and unsolved problem. What do you think are the chances you're right about that? 
Um, um, you know, you know take a more outside view. I think it's highly take, a, take a more outside view. I, I mean, think this is it. One can think it's highly likely one's wrong without thinking people who disagree with you are right. The chances are it's quite likely that we all share uh, assumptions that are mistaken, particularly in the case of consciousness where basically there isn't such a thing as a, an orthodox opinion. People are all over the map. So yes, I think it's highly likely I am mistaken, but it's not because I think necessarily that uh, sure. the person I'm arguing sure. with is correct. Right, right. So, so you think it's highly likely you're mistaken, and yet a lot of what you say hinges upon this problem. Well, fortunately, as I said, it is ultimately, uh, uh, this is it, this is an empirical question. If one thinks that the answer to the, that, that binding is a form of, 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 of macroscopic quantum coherence, this isn't purely uh, a philosophical argument. Now, I know philosophers aren't supposed to make empirical predictions, but uh, this, 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 this is one. Um, but yes, I could be completely mistaken, but I think if I am mistaken, the real answer will be something so bizarre that no one has yet, uh, yet thought of. Okay. Um, okay uh, yeah. To really boil it down, I, I think we should invite some of these questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, but, uh, I, 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 will I, I say we, 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 there are speculative problems and real problems, and, and mm. um, you know, I, right now I think the real problems are, are the, the ones, mm. you know, that uh, certainly occupy me. Mm -hmm. um, okay. There, there's some hands up there that seem to be wanting to get in on this discussion. Hi. I was just wondering about uh, like a lot of technologies, they may lead to enhancements or augmentation. But some technologies certainly diminish our intelligence. I'm thinking of things like um, airline pilots who now don't necessarily think of how to uh, guide a plane in a manual sense anymore because they are so used to the autopilot um, taking control of the airplane. And so they don't avert disaster when they could, uh, even though they may have the ability. They just don't think of it because they're uh, because the technology has taken control away from them so much. So how do you go about developing technologies that, I guess, avoid these kind of unintentional consequences? Well, look, it's, it's certainly a, a very important question and I, I, I don't feel qualified, really, to provide a useful answer. I'm not sure if, if Peter or David wants to contribute to, you know, the, one of the great laws of sort of history is is the, um, you know, the law of unintended consequences, right? Uh, and uh, uh, this is another uh, thing that gives me a lot of, a lot of pause about um, uh, certain kinds of research is, uh, and, and certain kinds of technological developments. Uh, the, uh, you introduce iPads and people write apps and suddenly you've got all kinds of unintended consequences. And... Um, those people who are thoroughly engaged in um, in in these sorts of activities, as far as I can tell, are are um, much more interested in how they can make money out of it than thinking about what unintended consequences there might be and whether those uh, are worth the you know the, the price, so to speak. Andrew Dunn, I think it is. Do you want to speak up? Yeah. Have you got a microphone? Oh, head off, Adam. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Peter has to leave. He does need to catch a plane. He, he needs to fly back to Queensland. So thank you very much, Peter. Cheers. If Peter misses his plane, his arms are going to be very tired at the end of the journey. So <laughs> thanks very much, Peter. Um, hope to see you again down here for another conference sometime. OK, sorry. Uh, and the question was, Andrew? Yeah, so when we're talking about where people are directing their energies, and we're talking about the notion that we have current problems that are very real and very substantial and they're not speculative, uh, and we have a range of people working on things such as philosophy, or such as speculative problems, or perhaps the existence of the Higgs boson, or whatever it might have to be, we're, we're bringing a portion of our resources into these, these less tangible issues. Uh, and part of what's coming also out of the conversation that I'm hearing is that perhaps right now, direct political action is, is maybe a better thing to be doing than even looking at, obviously, what you're doing team with technology is perhaps one of the few ways that technology can be directly used to change the situation. So my question to you is, how, if you had a magic wand, would you change the distribution of labour 
in our society yeah. and from where it is now. Yeah. Um, so under normal circumstances, then obviously it's, it's very important to put resources into questions like Higgs bosons and you know fundamentals of artificial intelligence and you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I don't think we're in any longer in normal circumstances. I think we're we're in you know there have been five previous major mass extinction events in human history, and we are bringing out the, the sixth one onto ourselves on a time scale much faster than any of the previous five. Uh, and so un, in that circumstance, we're talking about the end of human civilization and indeed the end of human as a very real possibility within the next couple of hundred years. And, and under those sorts of circumstances, these are not normal situations, right? And, and so, you, uh, so you do need to reallocate. And, and I'm, I'm not talking anything more necessarily more drastic than the kind of reallocation of resources that happened in the Second World War, where the, you know, the, the US economy, you know, they realised the seriousness of the situation they faced, and they, they did a massive kind of re-engineering, retooling, and they devoted huge amounts of resources to what were perceived to be what was needed to, be, to deal with the immediate crisis. Uh, and so I'm not, certainly not the first person to suggest that, you know, we, we, we ought to be thinking about ourselves in a certain sense uh, in, on a kind of war footing here. Uh, and that's why I'm kind of sceptical about, uh, you know, I, 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 I was a philosopher, I left philosophy, because I look at, you know, so much of what philosophers do and I say, Look, under normal circumstances, I think it's great for you to figure out to the nth degree what Thomas Aquinas thought about, you know, so, so and so. But under the same circumstances, it's a complete waste of resources, and, and I have no respect for it. So, <laughs> okay. What do you think about? Um, um, I'm aware that there are, there are people in this room who um, have greater and lesser degrees of um, faith in the um, viability of um, an AGI, but what do you think of leveraging, like focusing significant resources on a project to develop AI and leverage its power to basically avert all the immediate issues that you are worried about? Well, I just think it's utterly, utterly speculative and, and, you know, if great if you could, but, but really, uh, I, I just can't... Some of you might be able to, in a sense, enlighten me on this topic, but but if, if I, it's, I just can't see it being a re remotely real possibility. Well, um, yeah. So we've got um, we're just over time a little bit. If anybody wants a half an hour break, they can go break now. But for anybody who wants to stay and still um, participate in question and, uh, and answers, then please do so. Um, we'll be back at uh, at. Um, in about half an hour for Marcus's talk. So yeah, if you're leaving, please come back on time. Hi. Um, so Marcus's presentation is at five, so try to get back uh, at 4.55. Okay, so um, yeah, great question. David, have you got any uh, response to uh, whether we should build AI, AI to solve our problems? Well, it, once again, uh, just to... Can you, can you use the mic? Sorry, to reiterate... Away. Tim's point, though uh, a number of researchers are worried that someone in their basement could right now be building an AGI that goes foom, uh, I just don't see it's going to... Go, go. Sorry? Oh, no. Oh, someone's just talking to ah, someone right. else. Okay. Um, uh, I don't regard this as, 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 as an imminent threat. I think it misunderstands the nature of uh, intelligence. This is the problem, the same problem that we've had for the last two and a half thousand years or something. It's still militarism. I mean, we're spending the best part of two trillion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Only now we can have a fact there's an existential issue involved where there wasn't mm -hmm. with spears and swords. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about policing that can really finish the sword off permanently. So it seems like the issue is same issue it's always been, only on a huge scale, and it's the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think militarism is what's just one dimension as opposed to the root cause. Of, um. Yeah, it's probably not socio sociologically realistic, but one of uh, probably the, the cru a very crude but effective way of reducing existential and global catastrophic r uh, risk would probably be to elect uh, all-female government. Uh, <laughs> essentially, and no, I'm not saying that this is completely, well, not totally, but this is largely orthogonal to uh, the women's movement or anything like that. It's simply that 
nature essentially designed males to be hunters and warriors, uh, and essentially uh, uh, women do not spontaneously launch territorial war wars of aggression, whereas, whereas men do. And yeah, a woman can be just as nasty as a man, but nonetheless, it, it, though this sounds sexist, there is a very different uh, mindset involved there. And if, and it's a big if, one does think that existential risk is the greatest issue uh, 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 we face, then yes, opting to uh, elect all female government, might, but though of course incredibly sexist and discriminatory, it would, I suspect as a technical measure, it would reduce the, significantly reduce the likelihood of war. Um, why don't I, given the importance of this, uh, if, if this is the case, why don't I campaign on this issue? I'm unfortunately not convinced it's it, it's sociologically realistic. Uh, it's very difficult to keep people focused on the issue of would it, would it reduce, reduce the likelihood of war and instead it turns into a debate about, oh, you ought to meet my ex-wife or something like that. Um, Tasha? Hey, um, this question's for David. I missed the bit about the binding problem. Can you explain that a bit in a bit deeper depth and, and how maybe technologies, if we could work out how to mind meld how that would work and what, what that would do for society. Your point on it. Um, the binding problem again. Um, right, okay. Uh, um, why is it that, uh, whereas in the case of, let's say, the population of Australia, you have 20 uh, million odd discrete skull-bound minds and however they configure themselves and however they interact and however intimately whether to perform various complicated logico-linguistic operations, you do not get a unitary subject of experience. Why is it that nonetheless the, the cells of your brain that apparently at any rate are equally, you know, they're membrane bound, they appear to be a classical, some process, let's say, uh, color, others motion, uh, others vertices and so on. Why is it that when you are uh, uh, either uh, awake or dreaming, that nonetheless, instead of being a hundred billion odd discrete pixels of classical mind dust, that uh, somehow you are right now experiencing a unitary percept of this rather weird looking fellow apparently uh, two or three meters in front of your body image who is simply uh, one of a number of figures populating your visual field such as the unity of perception and the unity of the self. And if all, all this seems a bit vague and uh, philosophical, uh, earlier we touched on some of the syndromes in which binding partially breaks down. Um, and uh, uh, yes, uh, although in one sense, if you look at some, something like Alpha Dog that the Pentagon has come up with, or the little, uh, the, or, or the kind of robots, they're tremendously impressive uh, compared to organic robots, still extraordinarily limited. Uh, and yeah, a lot of the, what uh, intuitively are the easy problems in AI have turned out to be quite extraordinarily hard and the hard, uh, and the hard problems easy. Do you think that actual mind melding, if, if we could make a technology, what, what do you, that, that we could actually share each other's thoughts, literal mind melding, what, what do you think that would do to society or for society? I think it would help us realize that right now we are in a state of quite extraordinary ignorance. When people think of themselves as being ignorant, they're perhaps thinking of, oh, quantum physics is really difficult, or I don't know about electronics, X, Y, and Z. They're not thinking, I don't know what it's like to be another subject of experience. But if mind melding uh, 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 were possible, we would realize, uh, uh, yes, that essentially the, the, kind of the egocentric uh, uh, illusion is just that. It's a, a, a source of profound uh, uh, ignorance uh, that we tend in a kind of scientific society to privilege first per third person facts uh, over first person facts. But it is, yeah, it's a feature of the natural world what it is like to be you right now. And the fact that I apprehend you as a physical object you might have feelings is, yes, it, it is a profound cognitive handicap on my part. It's a, it's a deep epistemological limitation. Okay, um, I think we'll close on a question. Uh, I've got a question. Um, it's a thought experiment. <laughs> so, if, okay, it's a thought experiment. If we could develop a morality pill 
would you take the morality pill if it would make you more moral? And would you vote for other people taking the mor morality pill? Well, yes, it is, of course, a very <laughs> hypothetical very thought narrow experiment. Thought experiment. <laughs> I mean, but it's very if, if we can imagine that, you, that you're right, that it really mm. does make... I'm not saying that I'm right, I'm just... No, no, but experiment. imagine that, that somehow you had, you know, very high-level confidence that it really would p p p make mm. people more, more ethical, right? Um, uh, well, put it this way, I'd, I would support putting this in the water supply. <laughs> right? But, it, but I don't think you'll have, ever have that confidence that it would actually make people, you know. Uh, so in other words, it's sort of denying the premise mm. of the thought experiment, you know. Sure. Uh, but but it, mm. if I, yeah. Mm. But if I can try and put myself in, I'd support it. David? Uh, yes, I would take it, but I too, if it really were a morality pill, would be would put it in the uh, the water supply. But equally on the kind of the well, slightly metaphysical position I was arguing just now, uh, uh, yeah, if I could act in such a way that I cared about the interests of my future self 30 years hence, I wish I could do so. I'd behave rather selfishly, you know, with no savings or anything like that. It, that entity, my namesake in 30 years' time, is less real. Uh, but I think, yeah, it's a disguised form of selfishness, and I regard other subjects of experience as, uh, well, they are intellectually, I realize, just as real uh, as I am. So uh, if I were capable of this God's eye perspective, I would be able to intuit all and impartially appraise all other first person perspectives. And this morality pill is actually helping one apprehend uh, the world as it really is, as distinct from this uh, yeah, selection driven form of, 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 of selfishness, but not just selfishness, ignorance. Mm, nice. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for listening and uh, being part of the panel. Excellent questions from the audience as well. So put your hands together for David Pierce, Tim Van Gelder, and also Peter Ellison, who's left.